Hello, everyone. I'm honored to present this year's Sidney J. Friedberg Lecture at the National Gallery of Art. I'd like to thank Stephen Nelson so much for inviting me to speak today and for his generous introduction. Thanks also to Peter Lukart and Jen Rakowski for their assistance with just about everything. And I'd like to express my gratitude to Catherine Friedberg and the Friedberg family for endowing this lectureship. Today, I'll be discussing women artists, not a subject with which we usually associate Professor Friedberg. But in 1991, he gave the National Gallery of Art this beautiful, characteristic wash drawing by Elisabetta Sirani, which he had acquired as an anonymous Bolognese schoolwork at a London auction in 1976. He was apparently the first to recognize Sirani's authorship. We'll return to this drawing a bit later. My recent book examines the women artists of Bologna. Although they're less well known to modern audiences, they were once quite famous. As Carolina Bonafede attested, no other city has ever enjoyed Bologna's advantage in the number of women with predilections for the muses, with painters, sculptors, musicians, so many that they were covered with glory in those harsh disciplines that had seemed to be exclusively the province of men. Bonafede wrote this in 1845, in dedicating her book on 18 outstanding Bolognese women to the young women of the city, expressing her hope that these predecessors would provide apt models for imitation. Bonafede's book was the first contribution by a local woman writer to the subject, part of a pan-European development that saw more women contributing to art history in the 19th century. But she was also the last author for more than a century in a long line of Bolognese writers who celebrated the accomplishments of their female compatriots. This diminished interest in the achievements of most women artists lasted until the 1970s, when attention was rekindled by second wave feminism. But in early modern Bologna, for several centuries, writers celebrated gifted local women. One, in 1589, was Ercole Marascotti, author of the quotation that's part of my title today. Almost a hundred years later, Carlo Cesare Malvasia opined that Bologna has nothing to cede to any other city in painting. One of his arguments for Bolognese superiority was that the city was graced not only with talented men, but also with great women artists. This focus on women's accomplishments by Bolognese authors from the 16th through the 19th century distinguishes Bologna from every other Italian city of the era. Bologna became a center for women artists in terms of their success, numbers, diversity of specializations, and fame. Thanks to sympathetic writers, patrons and collectors from varied socioeconomic levels, and the liberalizing presence of its venerable university, among other factors, women artists thrived in Bologna. Its most renowned practitioners were Lavinia Fontana, the first professional female painter, famous for her high-priced portraits and the first woman to paint female nudes, and Elisabetta Sirani, who received more public commissions than any woman to date and spearheaded women's specialization in religious subjects in lieu of their traditional focus on portraits. Local writers praised them both with rare specificity, facilitating the identifications of hundreds of autograph works today. Their success encouraged many other women to pursue artistic professions. 
Bolognese printmakers included Veronica Fontana, whose woodcuts illustrated many of the most important publications of 17th century Bologna, including two books by Malvasia. Another printmaker was the etcher Elisabetta Machiavelli, who became one of the 35 honorary female members of the 18th century Bolognese Art Academy, the Accademia Clementina. Two sculptors were also celebrated during the 18th century. Clarice Vazzini, who created polychrome terracottas, such as this signed Annunciation, and the accomplished anatomist and wax sculptor Anna Morandi. Both received public commissions and were admitted to the Accademia Clementina. Today, I'll discuss women artists from Bologna and other Italian cities, proposing a few reconsiderations of our approaches to studying women artists. One key issue is how to deal with unreliable stories about them. An early example is Giorgio Vasari's romanticized account, we might even call it a fairy tale, about Properzia de Rossi, who was the only woman artist whose profile was included among 142 biographies in his Lives of the Artists in 1550. In his discussion of this marble relief for the Basilica of San Petronio, Vasari failed to mention that it was the first marble sculpture by an Italian woman for a public location. Instead, he interpreted this work, portraying the attempted seduction of Joseph in the Old Testament as an expression of the artist's own unhappy love affair. I think we can readily dismiss Vasari's interpretation as a typical example of reducing a woman's biography to her love life. But some factually unreliable accounts may offer insights that are more useful in understanding women's contributions. Put another way, some stories that are more myth than fact suggest some larger realities about women artists. One intriguing example of the mythologizing of a talented woman in Bologna involves Patizia Gozzadini, a 13th century woman whose historicity was re-examined in a recent essay by Paula Findlan. Gozzadini was celebrated by early Bolognese historians as a learned jurist who obtained her doctorate from Bologna's university, received a professorial chair there, and delivered a funeral oration for the deceased bishop, Enrico Fratta. Such accomplishments are improbable for a woman in the 13th century, and there's no extant documentation corroborating these claims. But as Finland shows, the 18th century Bolognese scholar Alessandro Machiavelli, who had his own reasons for exaggerating Gozzadini's accomplishments, forged documents to embellish her reputation for erudition. Gozzadini was the first in a long series of women who were acclaimed in Bologna for their scholarship or writings. Although this group includes historically verifiable women, the achievements of early figures like Gozzadini are often unsubstantiated. But true or not, the legend of the accomplished woman promoted an early tradition for extolling talented women in Bologna, long before any female visual artists are known. The Gozzadini myth laid the foundation for widespread acceptance of women's excellence in the city that was unequaled anywhere else in the Italian peninsula. This unusual attitude toward gifted women began to encompass the visual arts in the 15th century with the nun Caterina Vicri. Founder and abbess of the Poor Clares Convent in Bologna, Vigri was a writer, musician, and painter. 
celebrated for her miracles beginning immediately after her death in 1463. She was canonized only in the early 18th century, when she also became the patron saint of the Art Academy. Many paintings once ascribed to her have proved to be unsupportable attributions, such as the panel at right, which was long considered a miracle-working image by Vigri. Although only her breviary illustrations, such as the page at left, are still accepted as her work today, her association with the visual arts helped to legitimize that profession for women. The examples of Vigri and Gozzadini suggest that positive attitudes toward women's abilities, even when they expanded beyond reality into legend, helped to shape a culture in Bologna that was unusually appreciative of talented women. Bologna offers an opportunity to rethink some assumptions about women artists, thanks to the unprecedented number who worked there, a remarkable 68 from the 15th through the 18th century are recorded by name. Moreover, although most were painters, as is true throughout Italy, Bolognese women were also sculptors, printmakers, embroiderers, and disegnatrici, or creators of drawings. This embarrassment of riches facilitates a reassessment of some common beliefs about women artists in early modern Europe, beginning with firm evidence that there were more women artists and more successful ones than once supposed. Another assumption that I'd like to reconsider today is the widespread idea that when early modern women gained access to professional training, it was usually at home from their artist fathers. Yet another problematic allegation is that women painters were usually confined to certain subjects, typically portraiture or still life, and were rarely, if ever, successful in the public forum or compensated with fees comparable to their male contemporaries. None of these generalizations holds up in Bologna, which made me wonder about their validity elsewhere in Italy. Although Bologna boasted more women artists than any other Italian city during this period, other cities also had notable numbers of female practitioners, as you can see from my table, which shows statistics on the women artists recorded during the 17th century in five Italian cities. Although many women's names have surely been lost, and scholars will likely, hopefully, continue to find more, I estimate that there were at least 200 non-Bolognese Italian women named as artists by early writers or in documents through the 18th century. My numbers do not include the many anonymous women artists whose names have been lost. One of the most surprising discoveries of my book overturns the traditional idea that most early modern women artists were the daughters of other artists. Such a lineage from artistic families has often been understood as accounting for how women were able to receive professional training despite male-dominated institutions such as guilds and apprenticeship systems. But by the 17th century, most women artists in Bologna were trained either entirely or partially by men who were not their relatives. So this assumption that most were artists' daughters is inaccurate. Of course, some women in Bologna and elsewhere were the daughters of painters, as is true, for example, of both Lavinia Fontana and Elisabetta Sirani. But such family connections were not a prerequisite for their careers. On the other hand, coming from an artistic family probably facilitated access to important patrons and commissions, and hence to the greater visibility and fame of these painters' daughters. But of the six earliest recorded women artists in Bologna, 
during the 15th and 16th centuries, only Lavinia Fontana verifiably came from an artistic family. Sometimes, as with the 16th century sculptor Properzi de Rossi, her teachers are unknown, but she evidently came from a family of notaries, not artists. Was she self-taught, or did she receive training from a man who was not a family member? Women artists did not always come from artistic families outside Bologna either. The first famous woman painter in Italy, Sofonisba Anguissola of Cremona, was the daughter of a nobleman and was trained by men who were not her relatives. Michael Cole's recent book offers insights into her education. Giovanna Garzoni, a 17th century artist from Ascoli Piceno, was not from an artistic family either. She too trained with male non-relatives. Even Artemisia Gentileschi, the daughter of a painter, also studied with a man who was not a family member, her rapist, Agostino Tassi. As women artists became more numerous, it became acceptable for them to secure artistic training in various ways. Some studied with other women, but many worked with men who were not relatives. The elimination of what we've considered traditional constraints for women artists' training is important because this more open system enabled more women to become artists. One obstacle in reaching this realization, I think, is that there are no written explanations from the period that specify the expectations for women's artistic education. None of the extensive prescriptive literature on women seriously addresses their artistic training. Two popular publications from the 1520s, Baldassar Castiglione's The Courtier and The Education of a Christian Woman by Juan Luis Vives, for example, offer little guidance, although both consider women's education. Whereas Vives argued that women should learn textile arts such as weaving, spinning, and sewing, Castiglione suggested only that noble women should be educated, including a knowledge of literature and painting. All male writers devote far more attention to concerns for female chastity, virtue, and beauty. As historians such as Margaret King and Albert Rabel have argued, the pioneers in female education were Italian women humanists, several of whom, such as the Venetians Moderata Fonte and Lucrezia Marinella, argued that women's capabilities were equal to or even greater than those of men. But they, too, ignored women's education in the visual arts. Despite the absence of specific literary support for training women as visual artists, an increasing number of women worked as artists throughout Italy, and particularly in Bologna, opportunities for artistic education expanded to include the likelihood of women studying with men who were not members of their own families. This change suggests that the whole notion of women working as artists was becoming more acceptable, opening the door for greater success, particularly during the 17th and 18th centuries. Recently, I've been working on a comparative study of artistic education for women artists in five major Italian cities during the Seicento. I've found that to varying degrees, women worked with male non-relatives everywhere. In Naples, the largest city of 17th century Italy, there were comparatively few women artists. Only eight who lived during the 17th century were recorded in the 1740s by the Neapolitan biographer Bernardo de Dominici.
This apparently more conservative climate for women in Naples accords with the fact that all but one came from artistic families, although sometimes they also studied with male non-relatives. De Dominici's biography of the painter Diana de Rosa, who was born into an artistic family but also worked with Massimo Stanzione, a non-relative, is suggestive. Much of the biography recounts Diana's violent murder by her jealous husband, who wrongly suspected her of having an affair with her teacher. Although the veracity of this account has plausibly been questioned, and it fits the pattern of reducing a woman's vita to her love life, the story suggests that the practice of women studying with men outside their families was not accepted in Naples. In Venice, the second largest city in Italy during the century, many more women artists are recorded in early documents and biographies, an impressive 29, making it second only to Bologna in terms of raw numbers. In proportion to its total population, however, these numbers are less impressive, constituting only about 0.2 women artists per thousand inhabitants, a smaller percentage than any city discussed here apart from Naples. Moreover, with few exceptions, Early biographers have very little to say about these women or their creations, and few of them, before the 18th century, have any secure extant works. The Venetian author Carlo Ridolfi, in his compendium of some 150 artistic biographies in 1648, profiled only one woman, the painter Marietta Robusti. Tintoretto's daughter. Rodolfi's biography emphasizes Marietta's relationship with her famous father and provides few details on her paintings, contributing to the difficulty of identifying her works today. Occasionally, early inscriptions suggest her responsibility for drawings, as in the example I show at left. In 1663, Francesco Sansovino and Giustiniano Martignoni listed 11 Venetian women artists, but they provide little information on any of them, discussing no specific works and explaining their training and family origins only sometimes. They mention three daughters of the painter Niccolo Renieri, for example, and Chiara Varotari, a portraitist who was the daughter and sister of two male painters. But most others are not connected to artistic families, including most famously Irene da Spilimbergo, allegedly a student first of another woman and then of Titian. She died at the age of 21 in 1559 and was celebrated posthumously in a book of poetry. Despite her fame, no works can be credited to her today, and the poems about her chiefly praise her beauty and virtue rather than extolling her paintings. If few Venetian women are still known in extant works, it's due largely to the paucity of specific information from these early sources. Perhaps these writers were more interested in local women's collective existence as a type of cultural capital for the city, rather than in their individual careers. Our limited information makes it impossible to determine how many Venetian women trained with men who were not family members. Rome was perhaps the most significant Italian art center with the least established tradition for male artists to train female family members. During the 17th century, Rome enjoyed a sizable presence of local and foreign artists, including some 600 painters, according to Richard Speer. So the 24 women artists recorded there during the Seicento 
constitute a meager 4% of all painters in the city. Only 10 of them had male relatives who were artists, and only two were the daughters of painters, confirming Patrizia Cavazzini's important observation that most male painters in Rome did not train their daughters to paint. They trained their wives to assist in the family workshop somewhat more frequently, since four women were artists' spouses. The situation for women in Rome may reflect in some measure the dominance of famous male artists with strong connections to the papal court. But perhaps it also suggests a more flexible attitude toward women's artistic training outside of their families, since most women in Rome obtained at least some training from men who were not relatives. The smaller city of Florence was more sympathetic in many ways to women artists than Naples, Venice, or Rome. The 23 women artists recorded there in the 17th century constitute a larger proportion of the Florentine population than in these other cities. It's also striking that only about half of these women came from artistic families, with several of the exceptions coming from the nobility. One distinguishing factor in Florence is that so many women artists were nuns, at least a fifth in the 17th century, following an even larger percentage in the prior century when 15 were recorded, including the painter Plautilla Nelli. Nun artists trained in the convent, where they studied art with their sisters and by copying available artworks. Vasari confirms Nelly's reliance on drawings by Fra Bartolomeo. Overall, then, Florence evidently provided a more receptive environment for women artists than Naples, Venice, or Rome, as suggested by both their numbers and the origins of so many from non-artistic families. But the strong Florentine tradition of nun artists probably exempted them from direct collaboration with men who were not family members, and only four women artists, to my knowledge, worked with male non-relatives in 17th century Florence. In Bologna, which had the smallest population of any of these five cities, an astonishing 44 women were recorded as artists during the 17th century, constituting some 0.76 women artists per thousand inhabitants and accounting for about 12% of the 300 painters in the city, by far the highest percentage anywhere in both respects. Bolognese women artists were trained by men outside their families with increasing frequency during the 17th and early 18th centuries, contributing significantly to the large number of women artists in the city by making artistic training more readily available. During the early Seicento, only one Bolognese woman is known to have trained with a man who was not a family member. Antonia Pinelli, who worked with Ludovico Caracci and then married another painter late in life. Caracci provided Pinelli with designs for her paintings. I show her altarpiece of 1614, painted for the Bolognese church of the Santissima Nunziata and Ludovico's preparatory drawing for it. Pinelli followed this design, but added a self-portrait in a hat with a tall white feather at the left. The number of women artists in Bologna who received some or all of their professional training outside their families increased dramatically after 1650. Of the 35 women painters whose birth and or death dates fall during the Seicento, 15 came from families with no other artists, and seven from artistic families also studied with men who were non-relatives. In all, 22 women painters, 63% of the total, 
trained with male non-relatives. Although there were fewer women printmakers, an even higher percentage of them also studied with male non-relatives. The only Bolognese women artists who invariably came from artistic families were embroiderers. Leaving aside the anonymous nun embroiderers who've been studied by Patricia Rocco but are not recorded by name and so are not represented in my statistics, the five named Bolognese embroiderers were all the daughters or wives of painters. All five remain obscure figures today, and none of their works are still traceable. A few women painters in 17th century Bologna may have trained exclusively with male artists who were not family members, or possibly they joined those workshops after some initial training with Elisabetta Sirani. One example is Camilla Lauteri, who perhaps worked with Sirani before joining Carlo Cignani's workshop. Lauteri's extant paintings, such as the damaged altarpiece at Wright, have stylistic affinities with the works of both these putative teachers, but a personal relationship would not have been a prerequisite for such influence. Lucrezia Scarfaglia may have studied with Sirani before moving to the studio of Domenico Maria Canuti. Her few extant pictures show both painters' influence. Both these women, whether they studied with Sirani or not, followed her example in painting primarily religious subjects, and Scarfaglia's self-portrait was inspired by Sirani's own self-portrait. I think it's more helpful to understand Sirani's impact as due more broadly to her compelling example rather than to direct contact with her female successors. A large group of Bolognese women painters who lived too late to have studied with Sirani trained exclusively with male artists. The fascinating Teresa Moratori came from an academic family with no other artists. Moratori worked with at least three male non-relatives, Emilio Taruffi, Lorenzo Pazinelli, and Giovanni Giuseppo Dal Sole, all leading painters in late Seicento Bologna. Dal Sole's studio offers compelling evidence of women's collaboration with male non-relatives. He had four female students in his workshop, two of whom were not family members. Dal Sole was a founding member of Bologna's Accademia Clementina, which he served as vice principe in 1712. So the unprecedented presence of female non-relatives in his studio confirms the acceptability of this practice in the city. Thus, although all five cities I've discussed had some women artists training with male non-relatives during the 17th century, Bologna enjoyed the most established practice in this regard, and Naples the least. Second only to Bologna was Rome, although without yielding the same results in contributing to the proliferation of successful women artists in the city. If the frequency of artistic training with male non-relatives contributed to the large number of women artists in Bologna, a telling barometer of their success was the unprecedented number who specialized in history painting, that is, narrative pictures based on text, rather than portraiture, received public commissions, and were accepted into artistic academies. History paintings and public pictures were prestigious and lucrative, so breaking into this arena was a crucial step up for women. This development began with Lavinia Fontana during the late 16th century. 
Although she was better known as a portraitist, Fontana also painted many religious pictures, mostly private devotional works, but also including 24 public paintings, such as these two altarpieces. Although Bologna had no official artist's academy during her lifetime, both she and her successor, Elisabetta Serrani, were honorary members of the Accademia di San Luca in Rome. The critical figure in these developments is Elisabetta Serrani, whose well-documented production is 93% history paintings. She transformed even her portraits into history paintings, as in her striking life-size self-portrait as Judith with the head of Holofernes. Here, she fashions herself as the Israelite heroine who saved her people, one of several self-portraits in which Bolognese women connected themselves with compelling religious protagonists. The painting is signed and dated 1658, when she was 20 years old. It's one of many works attesting to her formidable skills from an early age, which qualified her to fit into established paradigms of admiration for the child prodigy that were more often employed for famous male artists. Serrani's entire production is dominated by her religious pictures, including some 35 public works during her short 10-year career. Her example had a lasting impact on her successors in Bologna. Serrani's public pictures were initially produced for provincial churches near Bologna, including these two examples, painted at the ages of 17 and 19 respectively for churches in Trasasso di Monzuno and Coscogno. At age 19, she also began receiving commissions for major pictures in Bolognese churches. Her baptism, a huge canvas with 36 figures for the Church of San Gerolamo della Certosa, is a pivotal work. The documented payment for it confirms that Serrani was paid as much as her male contemporaries, many of whom worked for the same church. And her design process for the composition is recorded in seven drawings the largest number of extant preparatory studies for a painting by an Italian woman from the period. Sirani was the earliest Italian woman to be explicitly famous for her drawings, the first whose drawings were widely collected, and the first still known in a sizable corpus of some 150 drawings. Lavinia Fontana created about 30 drawings that are still identifiable. But Fontana was not famous for her drawings, which were never discussed by early biographers and are rarely identified in early inventories. But Sirani's drawings are frequently praised by early writers and listed in inventories. Indeed, she ranks among the top Bolognese artists, male or female, whose drawings are most often identified in early Bolognese inventories. Sirani is also the first whose preparatory procedures can be meaningfully elucidated by extant preliminary studies. For her biographer, Malvasia, Serrani's skill in drawing was the mark of her genius, the kernel of exceptionality that made her artistry superior not only to other women, but also to most men. He admired her speed and facility, praising her method of using minimal preliminary chalk indications before applying the unerasable ink wash. The drawing that Sidney Friedberg gifted to the National Gallery of Art is another study in wash for a public picture. Painted for a church in Genoa that housed the sacred relic of the Volto Santo. Sirani depicts this relic performing a miracle, the exorcism of a possessed boy. 
The drawing's vigorous handling of wash, applied rapidly with the brush, imparts a convincing sense of three-dimensionality to the figures and animates them with vivid patterns that suggest a flickering light playing over the scene. Fewer chalk studies have been credited to the artist, but some dynamic examples in red chalk confirm Sirani's skill in this medium as well. By the time Elisabetta Sirani died at the age of 27 in 1665, many churches in Bologna and the region exhibited her paintings. These visible works probably helped to increase opportunities for her female successors, who were also encouraged by her success. 24 of those successors also produced paintings or sculptures for public locations. Moreover, most Bolognese women painters after Sirani specialized, as she had, in religious painting. In her immediate circle, both of her sisters and her assistant, Ginevra Cantofoli, were primarily religious painters who created altarpieces for churches. Although the works of many later women artists in Bologna are lost today, Teresa Muratori is still known in a dozen extant paintings. Most were painted for Bolognese churches, such as the documented Doubting of St. Thomas altarpiece, still in its original location in the Madonna di Galliera, which also houses her Immaculate Conception. Moratori is also one of Sirani's few successors by whom drawings are still identifiable, such as her preparatory study in red chalk for the Annunciation. For a drawing scholar like myself, it's particularly frustrating, however, that few Bolognese women artists are known today in extant drawings. They surely made drawings to prepare their works, but there is scant material evidence to support that assumption. This lacuna is a typical challenge to working on women artists whose works were often lost. Judging from surviving inventories, their drawings were not avidly collected as Sirani's were during the 17th and 18th centuries, and none of Sirani's successors were explicitly famous for their drawings as she was. Lucia Casalini Torelli, for example, was an honorary member of Bologna's Academy, who also opened her own academy with her husband and painted over 100 altarpieces and portraits between 1715 and 1762. But despite her success, there are no drawings ascribed to her today. So unlike the situation for Sirani, we cannot assess Casalini Torelli's practices in preparing her paintings. With rare exceptions, this paucity of surviving drawings is true of most women artists throughout Italy, at least until the 18th century, when their numerous extant sheets by Giulia Lama and Rosalba Carriera, both Venetians. Given the close association between a capacity for original invention and the practice of drawing in so much writing about art in the period, the disappearance of most women's drawings seems directly linked to disparagement of their creative contributions in comparison to male contemporaries whose drawings are generally better preserved. Such gaps in the historical record constitute a major challenge to working on women artists today. In 1971, when Linda Nochlin wrote her groundbreaking essay, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? She began the process of interrogating the methods scholars employed. She argued compellingly that artistic achievement was predicated not just on talent, but also on access to such key aspects of professional training as drawing the male nude from life. 
a practice from which women were long excluded, although works by Anna Morandi and Giulia Lama in 18th century Bologna and Venice suggest that this exclusion did not last as long as we once thought. Since 1971, scholars have rediscovered many great women artists. But equally important, we've been learning about culturally constructed phenomena that have often limited our appreciation of women artists. As Rosica Parker first observed years ago, these include the privileging of art over so-called craft, a distinction that relegated textile arts to a lower position on the hierarchical ladder and not coincidentally linked those crafts to women. Perhaps this disregard shaped the failure of Bolognese writers to provide any specifics on the five embroiderers they mentioned only in passing. Another issue concerns distinguishing between professional and amateur artists. In Bologna, it's sometimes impossible to clearly differentiate for female practitioners, given the limits of available information. Although a recent essay by Sheila Barker provides new insights on professional women artists in Florence. Some limitations were shaped by social expectations. Sofonisba Anguissola, for example, as a noblewoman, could not have begun her career painting public altarpieces. And few women painted frescoes, which demanded the sort of public collaboration with assistants that we assume was socially prohibited for most women, although Teresa Muratori provides an encouraging exception. A crucial challenge in working on early modern women artists is to develop methods that allow investigation of all women's works, avoiding conclusions that are predetermined by approaches that assume a more level playing field. And perhaps that investigation would benefit from moving beyond established cultural centers such as Bologna or Florence. I hope that scholars will continue finding ways to recover the exciting contributions of the many women who still await rediscovery. Thank you. Mm -hmm.